Um, Hi everyone, thanks again for tuning in. Um, I hope you like my new pink shirt. Anyway, I'm really pleased to um, introduce Chasha Mitra, who is another one of my former Linklaters colleagues. How are you? Can I? Oh, very you well. Are you still yeah. there? That's nickname. Yes, yes, please, Asnari. Good to see you after a very, very long time. But yeah, please call me Chaz. It is. It has been a very, very long time, and I think for most of the time that we've been away from each other, you've spent quite a large chunk of your career overseas is that right yes yeah that's right so um or just to sort of recap for the for the viewers uh, so i trained uh, at link laters i think his you were qualified by then uh a, a few years a few years more you senior were, you, i wasn't quite senior enough for you to be my trainee but yes <laughs> no, no, yeah no, not not quite but um I, unfortunately i missed out on that that as well uh so uh, trained at Link Laters and then um, uh, into the banking department, qualified there and um, moved overseas to Lehman in Tokyo. Um, I was covering their real estate uh, work there. So their business, which was fantastic, was involved uh, visiting hotels, office blocks and, um, and apartments that they were purchasing throughout Asia. Uh, the hotels that they were buying in Thailand and Koh Samui were particularly interesting. Uh, <laughs> I bet. Um, yeah. Two two points jump out at me: working overseas and then moving in house. How did you find that transition? Yeah. Um, to the to the, I think the the moving in house. Uh, I moved when I was probably about a year and a half qualified, which was very very junior. Um, for me, the real motivation behind moving was I, I wanted to get more responsibility. The work at Linklater was fascinating you'd read about it in the newspapers um, but invariably based in London you were always part of a very large team um, which meant that you, you you were less involved and you sort of saw less of the big picture and for me that the real interest was getting closer to the business side of things um, and th that that was the appeal um, I, I'm not sure whether there's any ever any right time to move uh, you know in-house uh, whether it's you know one one year five years six years I, I just don't know I think it just depends on your own personal appetite your, your risk appetite essentially agreed um, there's plenty of content on the Chief Little Careers website about that because it's a question I get asked so frequently yeah I'm too junior to move am I too senior um let's keep that for a separate discussion I'm curious to find out about your move to Tokyo Sure. Um, so I, I was very fortunate at Linklater to have done two seats overseas, uh, one in Singapore and one in Tokyo. Um, and again, you know, just what I was saying earlier about the levels of responsibility, what I found was when you're in the satellite offices that you were doing more of more of more of the work. Uh, it was less less front front page news, but it was at that level, you know, you were doing what an associate was doing rather than what a trainee had been doing in London. Um, so that that was the real driver. And, I, I, you know, I loved it out there. It was great um, skiing in winter, surfing in summer um, and just a totally different environment. Um, and also just culturally, it was, you know, for, for me personally, having been born, brought up in London, went to university in London and then working in London, you know, that was that would if I'd stayed in, in London, then that may have been it. But that that allowed me sort of a real diverse um, a cultural experience as well as um, the, the working uh, lifestyle. It was a fantastic few years there, I loved it. Now you're at Lehman and most people watching this probably were still at high school when Lehman <laughs> existed and Lehman is now synonymous with the financial crisis. Mm. I think you had left by the time it collapsed. Well, that's so right. You lived through the yeah. financial crisis whilst working in the financial sector how was that so how did you, um, you yes such a setback uh yeah so i to give to step back and give a bit of color so i left lehman in 06 actually two years to the day before they went under so um it wasn't my fault i know i held things together there but it wasn't to that extent so um <laughs> I, I left there to, um, actually to move back to London with Morgan Stanley where I joined the legal department and I was then covering their tax structured finance business which was you know fantastic work tons of different experience different underlying products um, 08 Lehman happened and uh, I remember sitting there I used to sit with the with the desk on the trading floor and 
it was like watching a car crash in small, slow motion. Everyone was just looking at their, the Morgan Stanley stock price going down. I remember the, the Friday um, when the stock price went down into single digits, it was pretty nerve wracking. And a lot of senior people on the floor were you know, walking around going like, oh my God, this is it, this is the end. And that's not what you expect. But the senior management really took control. Um, you know, the, the fallout always happens a couple of months later. So the desk that I was supporting was, was closed down. I mean, it didn't make sense for a bank to basically be taking money from the government in terms of bailout money, yeah. but then not paying their taxes. So that that world essentially closed down. Um, and from a personal perspective, it was very nerve wracking, um, you know, relatively, well, relatively young, um, sort of got, got, you know, financial commitments and so on. Um, and in February of 09, I was um, made redundant uh, from Morgan Stanley. Fortunately, um, through my contacts, actually at Morgan Stanley, I got rehired into a different area there. Um, and th this is, I think, to, to your point about, you know, what, 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 what can you make out of these situations? And for me, you know, having, having survived that Lehman, you know, and the rest of the financial crisis was actually, it was all your network. And that's what really kicked in, right? It was the relationships that you had developed whilst working it wherever, whether at Morgan Stanley, Lehman, for me, or, or Linklaters, and it's being in, keeping in touch with those colleagues who sort of borderline move from colleagues to friends, uh, you know, and and having that that personal contact. I and I was, yeah. I think that um, you know, people far too often neglect contacts that they've encountered in their past lives and previous jobs mm. and employers. And the focus is on meeting new people and believe that that's the only way to network. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. It's yeah. about really nurturing and cultivating, you know, the meaningful relationships you build over time and not neglecting those historic relationships. Um, absolutely. And I mean, the interesting thing is that just as, you know, sort of following on from that, um, the Lehman collapse was actually quite empowering in a certain way because all my contacts that had previously been at Lehman now exploded and they went to tons of different organisations. Um, so instead of having, you know, X number of people you knew at one organization, they were now at, scattered around different places. And because of that, uh, you know, uh, I think, I don't know whether it was Lehman, what the situation was Lehman in London or Lehman in New York, but Lehman in Asia, there's still a very active alumni network there who meet up. And if you need a hand or you want to be put in touch with someone that that person knows, they're always willing to help because I think that experience of, I didn't, you know, I wasn't at Lehman when it happened, but having gone through it and having shared that bond, that the bond is strong. And I think that's the same. I imagine that's the same that, you know, with, with Bear Stearns and, and some of the other institutions as well that unfortunately don't exist. So what advice would you give to people who are now having to live through the current nightmare we're experiencing, which is, you know, a recession caused by obviously something completely different, a mm. global health crisis. My experience of having lived through Lehman as well, but I was on the other side of the fence because by that point I'd already switched to journalism. This feels different. Yeah. It's, it's caused by a different challenge, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it is, it, you know, it, it's fascinating what's going on, but in a very strange way because everyone says you live through these you know once in a lifetime event well we've had two in our you know relatively recent working lives right um I, I from my from my own perspective i think it's again it's still maintaining that contact that network and it's very i think in some ways it's slightly easier to do nowadays um previously when you know when you were trying to meet up with people you'd have to arrange to have a coffee with them or so on right and that means that the person's taken half an hour out of their day which is usually pretty busy to spend the time with you and then you'll meet up with them and hopefully they'll give you a bit of a lead or say oh you should speak to this person I've got an idea now it's somewhat slightly easier because what you do is you have a chat with them on whatsapp so you don't disturb their day or, or whatever in in that half hour segment um, you get a couple of minutes here and there but it really is, you know, for, for me, I've spent, um, you know, last few months trying to, you know, rekindle those relationships and just seeing where people are, what they're up to. Um, and actually being able to put those people who are looking for new roles in touch with other people who are who are looking to do something else as well. But yeah, I, I, what you're saying is 100%. It, it is very different, but I think the fundamentals are still there, right? The network is always very, very important. And I don't think that network, um, the network obviously grows over time, but even as a junior 
um, whether you're a trainee or an associate, you know, relatively junior in your career, your network is going to be very, very strong. Because if you think about it, the deal teams that you've worked with on transactions on the other side, there's a network there that most people actually don't think about tapping. But if you need that, you know, advice, guidance or so on, or you've built some form of rapport with, um, you know, a counterparty or, or a solicitor on the other side, um, they're, they're very happy to do that. I'm always, you know, it's flattering actually being asked for advice, basically. Agreed. I think that, you know, a lot of people feel awkward asking for help. And I think that's mm. a sad reflection on what you, how you see your network. I think most people have it in them to offer some of their time up to help others. And I agree with you also about the point regarding networking being easier in this climate in some ways, because mm. I don't know about you, but I don't miss going to networking events because I don't think they're necessarily the best way to develop relationships anyway. It's more about those one-to-one -one conversations. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think the networking events for me have always been good because it's a, um, I think it's the first step in having that follow-up meeting. Agreed. And, and that, that, that's, that's where I find the value. So I always see the network as sort of like, you know, that, your, your hand with the fingers going off. And that network will allow, that networking event allows you to meet four or five people. And of course, and for the record, I'm not suggesting that people should stop going to networking oh, when no. they come back. I'm saying that that's only a tiny chunk of what Absolutely. involves. And people yeah, yeah. sometimes put a disproportionate amount of sort of emphasis on going to these events and feel really disheartened by not being able to go to them at the moment and I'm saying that yeah. there are ways around it and yeah. these one-to-one -one conversations can be just as impactful if not more. Yeah I've always viewed it that it's a follow-up meeting which is the, the the homework bit that's the harder bit right to basically really? have you have you been able to engage with someone at a networking initial networking event enough for them to want to meet you again and usually that 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 that, that is the case and yeah, then to develop that relationship. Make it converting yeah. that yeah. initial enc enc encounter into that one-to-one. -one. So, mm, yeah, no, know, absolutely. We talk about networking forever, it's one of my yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, this is about you and your career. So you quickly bounce back from sort of the financial crisis, you know, use your network to sort of great advantage to get back onto the horse, so to speak. Um, you've also done something else that's quite unusual, which is worked in the sort of front office of a bank. Yeah. Which is again, sort of for so many lawyers, a bit of a holy grail to try to move away from the sort of back office support function, you know, that reputation that some in-house banking lawyers get, which is you're the no person. How mm. did you navigate that sort of journey? Yeah, it, 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 so again, interesting. It was, you know, when, you, when I think about it, it, it was a network again. So what happened was, you know, when I moved into the new role at Morgan Stanley, I was covering a desk. And the desk was looking, it does structured secured funding. So basically going out and borrowing long-term money using Morgan Stanley's own assets. And I was providing legal coverage. So the person who was on the desk was short-staffed and overworked. And it was a coffee and saying, you know, do you need some help? And their answer was, I probably couldn't afford you. And I said, you'd be surprised. Um, and the next thing I know, I was doing two jobs because I was still doing my old job and covering that desk yeah. in the front, you know, more front office. But then that that moved over. Um, but the, you know, again, it's that network. And I remember the the person I reported to in the, the the sort of previous role was very supportive, and that that was fantastic because you know this this guy has really helped me out. I, I was, you know, I wasn't going to be working. He got me a job. I'd only been there about six months, mm -hmm. and you know, it's creating that culture and that that person realizing that actually it's better to have someone happy involved and giving within the organization rather than sort of keeping them held back mm -hmm. now work in the front office fantastic you know for me it was enjoyable uh, it was very very hard work very different how does it work. compare yeah how does it compare to being a lawyer um the the interesting thing was that you end up picking the phone up to the lawyers and telling them what you needed to do right um which is somewhat what you do when you're in-house but this was to, to a greater extent because you're picking up the phone to your internal lawyers then going to the legal meetings um, you always get tarnished with that lawyer's brush right if you're on trading floor no one likes a lawyer right none of the traders like lawyers none of the business guys like lawyers and um, you know there's always a disparaging marker why don't we get the lawyer to read it or whatever and so I don't yeah that, that's slightly different but uh, again it's building up that relationship and getting that trust uh, for me it was you know really rewarding particularly so because a lot of it meant uh, a lot of the role meant traveling back to Asia mm -hmm. and in particular Japan 
And then, you know, those Lehman relationships came in useful. So building relationships with contacts and so on. Um, again, I don't think it's for everyone. It's very, it's very unstructured working in the front office. Um, I, I find it. So. At what point did you decide that you weren't going to sort of pursue a career in private practice and work towards partnership? Because, mm. you know, that... Um, I, and, I, yeah. and I don't think, you know, for some people, obviously, they make that decision really early. Some yeah. people enter the profession having already made that decision. Yeah. Others, you know, make that decision very belatedly either because they've realised that being a partner isn't all that it's made out to be. Or, sadly, they get that tap on the shoulder saying, we're really sorry, but we don't think what it, you've got what yeah. it takes. And I don't think necessarily not being a partner means that you're a failed lawyer by mm. any stretch of the imagination. Mm. But it would be just interesting to hear what you would be saying to people who are having that thought process now and deciding what to, to follow. Um, yeah, I think it, um, uh, 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 yeah, I made that decision, I think, relatively early as well. Um, it, it, I think if I had wanted to, you know, make partner and if I, I think the ability to make partner is a different thing and that, that I, I've got no yeah, insight. Well, so. And being able to do it, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 So from the wanting side, um, I just uh, for me, it was too, I was I was too far removed from the action at a large law firm. Uh, ultimately, that was it. I, I the, the bit when I look back at the, you know, the work that I've done, the most interesting stuff is sitting in a room with a whiteboard and drawing stuff up and saying this is what we should do. And I just didn't see enough of that, at, uh, you know, at, at the junior stage. I know that's totally different when you make it at the senior stage and you get called into those meetings and so on but I really really enjoyed that and I wanted to do that earlier on um, and, and it's that creative problem solving and you can get involved in that to a certain extent depending on the type of work you're doing and the opportunities you get um, but I always found that in-house that that was always there um, you know I, I, a partnership um, I didn't it didn't appeal to me, I don't think. I, and there were there were a number of sort of personal reasons. I think the the hours that you you know the, the commitment that you have to make, and the sacrifices that that entails um, in order to get there, that, that it, it just wasn't for me. I know some people love it and they thrive on it, and that's fantastic. Um, but interestingly enough, my last role was back at Linklaters uh, on a on a consultancy basis, and it, you know then it's very different. So you're seeing what the partners do, and they're doing the stuff that I wanted to do, the white room, and you you're scratching your head and coming up with the solutions. Um, but you you don't. I, I think I was too impatient, basically, to to to, to sort of stick it out and to do that type of work at the later stage. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's a very, very personal decision. Mm. All I'm urging you all to do is to think about it really carefully and um, to try to engineer some of your sort of career progression by proactively rather than leaving it to chance. How, where you end up is ultimately your decision, but you could only have greater control over that decision-making process if you manage your career progression proactively and make the right noises and pursue the right clients and the quite right relationships absolutely and i also think that you know i remember sort of being a trainee and again uh, you know newly qualified that um you're not really aware of what opportunities are out there you've you know you've you've come out of university you've gone to law school you've gone to you've done your training contract you 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 sort of see things in a very sort of slightly blinkered way just purely because of your own you know naivety i think mm -hmm. um but it's only when you start and, and interesting enough when i took the first role at lehman in-house i didn't know what the different functions were within the bank right you know, because you don't you, you don't learn that until you actually see it and even i think you know uh, whether you've gone through a secondment or you've spoken to people there but even if you spoke to people it's only when you're working there you go like okay that's what those guys do and this is what you know how the bank is structured. Can I make a confession I still don't and if I looked at your CV I probably wouldn't know what some of what you do involves but that's, that's very point. yeah um, but I agree with you and I think without doing the hard sell for cheap little careers mm. if a website like ours existed when we were going through those decision making processes it would yeah. be so much easier because can you recall anyone having this sort of conversation with you when you were junior associate? No, not, not, not at all. And this is why I, I think that... I think firms are doing more and there is a lot more information out there, but there was an element of wandering around, the dark, walking around in the dark. Yeah. And leaving a lot of stuff to chance, not because you're being, you know, irresponsible, 
but mm. because the information just wasn't there to enable you to make those informed decisions. Yeah, and, and I also think that you know now that the, 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 you're absolutely right, the level of information available is it's unbelievable the, the, you know the vlogs that people have showing what the inside of an office is what 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 the inside the only time you know sort of saw the office floor was when you get taken around a tour of the building and stuff but seeing it from you know one of the, some of the vlogs and stuff is it's amazing that that level of information was never there and it was slightly mystified um yeah, I, not deliberately so but we we grew up in a we grew up in a different era i think unfortunately we did and yeah I'd, let, let's not focus too much on that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. because we'll be revealing our ages let's talk a bit about consultant lawyering because you are sort of that's the route you ultimately ended up pursuing it seems to yeah. work really well for you which is fantastic C can you sort of demystify consultant lawyering i get questions about this fired at me quite regularly people yeah. seem to be quite curious but not really sure how it works um yeah so um I, I, um again i'll uh, try and give you a bit of background as to how i've ended up doing what I'm doing and the, the path actually, because it wasn't straight to become a consultant lawyer. I've ended up doing consultancy, but not in, in a legal fashion. But then again, like I said earlier, you're always viewed with that legal uh, taint as it were. And you know, no one's gonna get fired for hiring a lawyer basically. Um, so I, I've, I've done a number of projects which have either been regulatory in nature or um, you know, the, 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 the sort of audit driven. Um, so either looking at documentation from a legal perspective and compare it with what's in the booking systems. And obviously I was looking at the legal documents and the trade trade the quant guys were looking at the bookings to make sure they matched. Um, then more regulatory projects, Brexit, for instance, I was very fortunate to be at a bank where I was working on a funding project. Um, and I was the only lawyer in the London office. Um, I wasn't in the legal team. Um, and they, needed someone to help them apply for the license uh, to the central bank in Ireland to get their, their regulatory approval. And, you know, managing that, that, that was a legal, legal thing, but it was, I wasn't in the legal department. Um, and more latterly, as I mentioned, um, I, I did some, I've done, done a stint back at Linklater's uh, in, in, in private practice, uh, which was very interesting going back to the same firm after you know, nearly 17 years um, that, that you were there. Um, and now um, I'm doing a consulting role uh, at another bank within the legal department. So legal consulting is essentially where you're looking, where, where firms are looking to get a lawyer in to do a, usually a particular type of work. It might be maternity cover um, or it may be um, to deal with a specific project. For instance, there's a lot of work now on you know eyeball projects and so on. And they're looking for lawyers to do that. Um, and I'd say traditionally, I think people are slightly uh, you know and the more senior end ended up doing this but I think that's changed quite considerably and a lot of platforms uh, are looking for you know lawyers at the more junior end to help them um, staff these projects uh, because it's more efficient to get these lawyers in than it is to get like is it the link latest one really Yes, Relink. Um, I'm also on some other... Really exist, so let's mention a few more just for the audience's sake. So we've got um, A, which is PeerPoint. Yep. Adaptive, which is part of Sims and Simmons. Then you've got um, AG Integrate, Vario, which is Pillars and Masons. So I think from my perspective, you can register with quite a few, can't you? Yeah. Uh, but the, the placements reflect their sort of typical client base as an author. Yeah, exactly. So I'm on the PeerPoint panel as well. And I think traditionally what, what's happened is that previously um, uh, law firms used to send secondees into, into banks and financial institutions to help out. Um, you know, sometimes that's difficult to get. And this, these platforms allow them to, you know, provide that staffing uh, to, to, the, to the banks, the firms that need them, um, rather than getting a link laser or an A&O or a CC lawyer that they're, they're put in um, using the, you know this panel um, and you get to see a huge variety of work um, and that's what's interesting about it the interesting thing is you you can pick and choose how long your project is how many days you work you have that flexibility and how many is it quite easy to get a placement once you're on the books or do you need to build in a you know a few months within your year where you would be in between placements or projects yeah, I, I think that varies immensely. And this year hasn't been a typical year. So um, I've been very fortunate that since I started sort of consulting in 2014, it's been um, it's been a pretty good sweep sort of throughout. There hasn't been any any fallow periods um, this year. Um, I finished my last role in March. I decided to take a bit of time off. We had a baby. So 
So spend okay. some time. Thank you. Yeah, spend some time. Um, uh, you know, trying to look after, uh, trying to look after him. Um, I was only hoping to take maybe a month or two off, but it's been it ended up being longer because of the COVID situation. Um, but there are roles out there, but it, it just depends on you know what comes, what opportunities arise, and the interesting thing is you can actually sort of pick and choose. So it's your it's your it's your career that you're developing and how long you want. Um, what sort of people are suited towards this style of working? Because I'm assuming it's not for everyone. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I'd say you, you need, need someone to... who is not too risk averse because it sounds less predictable in terms of projects and hours of work compared to yeah. just being employed in a full-time role permanently. Yeah, um, I'd say you've got to be slightly entrepreneurial um, okay. because you have to market yourself to an extent that you don't do as a permanent employee. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to go out and find roles, uh, you know, whether through a platform, um, you're doing a lot more interviews than you would do if you were you know permanent so you you might interview for four or five roles you may decide you don't like them or or you may you know you may not the the, the employer may not think you're suitable as well mm -hmm. um so I, I think there's that level of entrepreneurship i think you've got to be very flexible as well um and flexibility in in order uh, you turn your hand to whatever comes through the door um and that's a very different skill set um that um you know I, I, you know i remember being junior very junior and starting you, you end up sort of in a bit of a cold sweat when something new comes at you um but then later on you you realize actually not looking for an answer there and then they're just looking for the roadmap what's the process uh how do you um how do, how do you get to answer that question what do you need to do and and put it in a way that um is articulate reasonable and then can be presented internally um to say look this is the approach we're taking um, this is what we think we'll do. So I, I think there's that flexibility. Um, you really also... need to step out of your comfort zone by the sounds of it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. uh, absolutely. But that, that's the interesting thing, right? You're seeing varied work. I mean, if you had told me a few years ago that I'd be dealing with a, you know, a regulator, which is not really my bag, it was, you know, that's not what I tended to do. Um, I would have said, are you sure? But then, you know, once you've done it, it's like, okay, fine. And it's interesting. Then you get the feedback. So we're actually, they thought you did a great job, which is, um, yeah, very rewarding. Okay. Moving on from sort of consultant lawyering and uh, viewers again, do keep out and look out on the website. We'll be publishing more content on that way of working in the future. But let's just go back to, shall we do a bit of a reminiscing? <laughs> Days of being lawyers. Uh, together how what do you think is you know what changes really stand out to you in terms of the way the legal sector has evolved i mean um, really it's you know the, the the one that jumps out the most of course is technology technology yeah, yeah the fact that you know we used to be in data rooms that had physical documents in them whereas now yeah. it's virtual and yeah. then the other one i think where there is change afoot but it's still a massive issue, of course, diversity. Mm. Um, look, I, th I think I think um, the, the element that's changed, uh, you know, the in information technology and so on, we spoke about the, the amount of information available to people and they're better placed to make decisions now. Um, I'd also say there's a lot more control that people have over their careers now. And I, I remember, you know, sort of very, again, at the more junior stage was, you felt that you didn't have that much control over your destiny, but I think that's totally changed. I think people are far more savvy as to what is available, what their skill set is, and what they want to do. Um, I, I think that's I, I think that's the main change. D diversity wise, I mean, I've you know, um, be, being from an ethnic background myself, um, I I've always found that the, the places that I've worked have been very open to that but I have noticed you know a lot of the, the firms are now um, putting on events particularly for their their BAME um, employees and to, 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 to sort of develop those relationships which I think is brilliant um, you, you know the, to try and encourage people to come and see these firms that wouldn't normally see them and I think that 
the diversity of the intakes the trainees that I was working with recently is, is very, very impressive um, in terms of diversity, but also their education and background and their skill set and um, experiences they bring. Um, so I agree with you. That. I think in the junior end, there is a lot more diversity. What worries me is the fact that that hasn't translated into a more diverse makeup within partnerships. Yeah. And, you know, you what do you think the legal sector can learn from the banking sector, where I do think that there has been greater progress in this space? Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, you know, interesting. I think on uh, on that one, um, I think it takes longer to get to partnership than it does to get senior in a bank. So if you are very good, you don't have to wait X number of years. It's not done on a PQE basis, right? It's basically done on your, the revenue you've generated, um, and it's more of a, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a, a more transparent meritocracy. Uh, basically, if you're if you're good and you're you know you can show that you're bringing in the money if you're in the front office, then you can do that. Uh, you know, ultimately, legal experience comes by number of years, um, so there is that time delay. Um, I think in terms of encouraging it, um, you know, ultimately, the legal profession in law firms, you're you're in a service sector, right? You're providing service to a client. If that client wants something done, you have to do it. You you are providing service. At a bank, it's slightly different. Okay, you've got a lot more autonomy. You can dictate the pace of you know your work that you're going to be doing. And I, I, I remember having these conversations with you when we were you know in the canteen many years ago. It was basically you might be doing not very much during the day, and then the phone goes at five. You know, the phone goes at five o'clock, and then that's it. You're you're there till God knows when that evening. Um, I don't think that's changed. I think the challenge is how do you how do you encourage people to 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 want to stay in that lifestyle and maybe that that's that's a tricky bit and i i don't know what well, the for me is. it's that sort of lack of role model i think that a lot of people feel that it's not within their reach because they don't see other people sort of being there and i know from from my perspective one factor or and there were many factors that resulted in me leaving law was that lack of role models but more from the perspective of being a female mm, okay. um you know seeing what female partners had to be doing yeah make it sort of thing so but i think that you know the the culture within law firms has changed significantly in terms of you know there's a lot more emphasis on work-life balance well-being etc so therefore you know it should be a little bit easier for for women or you know people who are not the mainstream to to progress mm. but there also but there needs to also be i think more open dialogue about some of the sort of challenges that people from non-traditional backgrounds encounter in the workplace. Yeah. It's a complex um, topic, and you know, there is no silver bullet that's going to fix it in one fell swoop. But yeah, no, I'm thinking about it is, is a good start. Yeah, I think the technology point that you know you you mentioned earlier, allowing, you know, which gives a flexibility to working from home and so on when need be. And actually what's going on at the moment, I think is made it, you know, let's see how long it lasts mm -hmm. uh, when things go back to normal, because, you know, ultimately I, I always think that you need, I learned more from being in the office and sort of what the osmosis process, especially when you're sharing an office with someone and you can pick up what they're doing, how they're, you know, in, interfacing with their clients, with other colleagues and so on internally. That, that you learn a lot from. Um, uh, but I think that the technology allows that flexibility. But I think for what I'm seeing, the more, you know, more junior uh, lawyers at the moment actually do take a lot more ownership of their career. And they actually make it very clear that I'm, you know, I'm done, I'm going home, I'll log on when I get home. And... Yeah, there is definitely a shift in that direction, mm. which I think is a positive development. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. So just to wrap up, any final thoughts? What what what's twenty twenty one looking like for for Chaz? Um, a lot of uncertainty, I think, for like as with everyone else. Um, I'm looking forward to it because I think there's new challenges ahead. Um, you know, the, the 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 COVID thing is, I think, quite unsettling for a, a large number of institutions. Um, but it, it, ultimately, I think lawyers are going to be employed anyway right because we've got the, the the fallout from brexit whether good or bad or whatever but there's going to be a lot of changes there um the the covid uh, the, the restructurings that are going to be happening in the economy all the work that's involved in that um there's there's i think there's there's plenty of opportunities it's a matter of sort of nurturing in them and um uh, you know harnessing them essentially and trying to develop that into roles 
Yeah, I think it's about holding the nerve and actually turn some of those challenges into opportunities. Yeah, because absolutely. I was talking to a lawyer um, a couple of days ago and he was saying that, again, going back to what we've said about the financial crisis, this does feel different and mm. it's actually generated quite a lot of work for law firms and for in-house lawyers. And then you've got Brexit, as you've mentioned. You also touched very briefly upon libel and the libel discontinuation. So th there's plenty of work to be had. And I think so it's going to be a lesson in resilience and sort of tenacity and grit and gut, I think. Mm. And flexibility as well. Um, yes, and I think yeah, it's yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Chaz, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. Um, thank you very much for your time. Really fascinating. Uh, to hear what you've been up to since we last sort of spoke to each other and uh, all the best for you and your new baby and uh, hopefully we, it won't be so long the next time we catch up yeah absolutely thank you very much for starting.